Lecture 4. The Hero as Priest. Luther. Reformation. Knox. Puritanism. May 15, 1840. Our present discourse is to be of the great man as priest. We have repeatedly endeavoured to explain that all sorts of heroes are intrinsically of the same material. But given a great soul, open to the divine significance of life, then there is a given a man fit to speak of this, to sing of this, to fight and work for this, in a great, victorious, enduring manner. That is given a hero, the outward shape of whom will depend on the time and the environment he finds himself in. Priest, too, as I understand it, is a kind of prophet. In him, too, there is required to be a light of inspiration, as we must uh, name it. He presides over the worship of the people, is the uniter of them with the unseen holy. He is the spiritual captain of the people. As the prophet is their spiritual king with many captains. He guides them heavenward by wise guidance through this earth and its work. The ideal of him is that he too be what we can call a voice from the unseen heaven, interpreting even as a more awful splendor, uh, even as the prophet did, and in a more familiar manner unfolding to the same to men. The unseen heaven, the open secret of the universe, which so few have an eye for. He is prophet shorn of his more awful splendor, burning of mild, equable radiance as the enlightener of daily life. This, I say, is the ideal of a priest. So in old times, so in these, and in all times. One knows very well that in reducing ideals to practice, great latitude of tolerance is needful, very great. But a priest who is not this at all, who does not any longer aim or try to be this, is a character of whom we had rather not speak in this place. Luther and Knox were by express vocation priests, and did faithfully perform that function in its common sense. Yet it will suit us better to have considered them chiefly in their historical character, rather as reformers than priests. There has been other priests, perhaps equally notable, in karma times, for doing faithfully the office of a leader of worship, bringing down by faithful heroism in that kind, a light from heaven into the daily life of their people, leading them forward as under God's guidance in the way wherein they were to go. But when this same way was a rough one of battle, confusion and danger, the spiritual captain who led through that becomes, especially to us who live under the fruit of his leading, more notable than any other. He is the warfaring, battling priest, who led his people, not to quiet faithful labour as in smooth times, but to faithful, valorous conflict, in times all violent, dismembered, a more perilous service, and a more memorable one, be it higher or not. These two men we will encounter our best priests, inasmuch as they were our best reformers. Nay, I may ask, is not every true reformer by the nature of him a priest, first of all? He appeals to heaven's invisible justice against earth's invisible force, knows that it, the invisible, is strong and alone strong. He is a believer in the divine truth of things, a seer, seeing through the shows of things, a worshipper in one way or the other of the divine truth of things, a priest, that is. If he be not first a priest, he will never be good for much as a reformer. Thus, then, as we have seen great men in various situations building up religions, heroic forms of human existence in this world, theories of life worthy to be sung by a Dante, practices of life by a Shakespeare, we are now to see the reverse process, which also is necessary, which also may be carried on the heroic manner. Curious how this should be necessary, yet necessary it is. The mild shining of the poet's light has to give place to the fierce lightning of the reformer, Unfortunately, the reformer too is a personage that cannot fail in history. The poet, indeed, with his mildness, what is he but the product and ultimate adjustment of reform or prophecy with its fierceness? No wild St. Dominic's and Thebeard Eremites that had been no melodious Dante. Rough, practical endeavour. Scandinavian another from Odin to Walter Raleigh Ulfila to Cranmer, enabled Shakespeare to speak. Nay, the finished poet, 
a remark sometimes is a symptom that his epoch itself has reached perfection and is finished. That before long there will be a new epoch, new reformers needed. Doubtless it were finer could we go along always with this same way of music, be tamed and taught by our poets as the rude creatures were by their Orpheus of old. Or failing this rhythmic musical way, how good were it could we get so much as into the equable way? I mean, if peaceable priests reforming from day to day would always suffice us. But it is not so. Even this latter has not yet been realised. Alas, the battling reformer too is, from time to time, a needful and inevitable phenomenon. Obstructions are never wanting. The very things that were once indispensable furtherances become obstructions, and need to be shaken off, and left behind us. A business often of enormous difficulty. It is notable enough, surely, how a theorem, or spiritual representation, so we must call it, which once took in the whole universe and was completely satisfactory in all parts of it to the highly discursive, acute intellect of Dante, one of the greatest minds in the world, had, in the course of another century, become dubitable to common intellects, become deniable, and is now, to every one of us, flatly incredible. Obsolete as Odin's theorem. To Dante, human existence and God's ways with men were all well represented by those melibogues, purgatorios, to Luther not well. How was this? Why could not Dante's Catholicism continue? But Luther's Protestantism must needs follow. Alas, nothing will continue. I do not make much of progress of the species as handled in these times of ours, nor do I think you would care to hear much about it. The talk on that subject is too often of the most extravagant, confused sort. Yet I may say the fact itself seems certain enough. Now we can trace out the inevitable necessity of it in the nature of things. Every man, as I have stated somewhere, is not only a learner but a doer. He learns with the mind given him what has been, but with that same mind he discovers farther. He invents and devises somewhat of his own, absolutely without originality, there is no man. No man whatever believes or can believe exactly what his grandfather believed. He enlarges somewhat by fresh discovery, his view of the universe, and consequently his theorem of the universe, which is an infinite universe, and can never be embraced wholly or finally by any view or theorem in any conceivable enlargement. He enlarges somewhat, I say, finds someone that was credible to his grandfather, incredible to him, false to him, inconsistent with some new thing he has discovered or observed. It is the history of every man, and in the history of mankind, we see it summed up in to great historical amounts, revolutions, new epochs. Dante's mountain of uh, purgatory does not stand in the ocean of the other hemisphere, uh, when Columbus has once sailed thither. Men find no such thing extent in the other hemisphere. It is not there. We must cease to believe it to be there. So with all beliefs whatsoever in this world, all system of belief and systems of practice that spring from these. If we add now the melancholy fact that when belief waxes uncertain, practice too becomes unsound, and errors, injustices, and miseries everywhere more and more prevail, we shall see material enough for revolution. At all times and all turns, a man who will do faithfully needs to believe firmly. If he have to ask at every turn the world's suffrage, if he cannot dispense the world's suffrage and make his own suffrage serve, he is a poor eye-servant. The work committed to him will be misdone. Every such man is a daily contributor to the inevitable downfall. Whatsoever work he does, dishonestly, with an eye to the outward look of it, is a new offence, parent of new misery to somebody or other. Offences accumulate till they become insupportable, and are then violently burst through, cleared off as if by explosion. Dante's sublime Catholicism, incredible now in theory and defence still worse by faithless, doubting and dishonest practice, has to be torn asunder by a Luther. Shakespeare's noble feudalism, as beautiful as it once looked and was, has to end in a French Revolution. The accumulation of offences is, as we say, too literally exploded, blasted asunder volcanically, and there are long 
troublous periods before matters come to a settlement again. Surely it were a mournful enough uh, thing to look at only at this face of the matter and find in all human opinions and arrangements merely the fact that they were uncertain, temporary, subject to the law of death. At bottom is not so. All death, here too we find, is but of the body, not of the essence or soul. All destruction by violent revolution, or howsoever it be, is but new creation on a wider scale. Odinism was valour. Christianism was humility. A nobler kind of valour. No thought that ever dwelt honestly is true in the heart of man, but was an honest insight into God's truth on man's part, and has an essential truth in it which endures through all changes, and everlasting possession for us all. And on the other hand, what a melancholy notion is that which has to be and has to represent all men in all countries and times except our own as having spent their life in blind, condemnable error, mere lost pagans, Scandinavians, Mahometans, only that we might have the true ultimate knowledge. All generations of men were lost and wrong. Only that this present little section of a generation might be saved and right. They all marched forward there, all generations since the beginning of the world, like the Russian soldiers into the ditch at the Schweidnitz fort, only to fill up the ditch with their dead bodies, that we might march over it and take the place. It is an incredible hypothesis. Such incredible hypothesis we have seen maintained with fierce emphasis, and this or the other poor individual man with his sect of individual men marching as over the dead bodies of all men towards sure victory, but when he too, with his hypothesis and ultimate infallible credo, sank into the ditch and became a dead body, what was to be said? With all that is an important fact in the nature of man, that he tends to reckon with his own insight as final, and goes upon it as such. He will always do it, I suppose, in one or the other way, but it must be in some wider, wiser way than this. Are not all true men that live, or that have ever lived, soldiers of the same army, enlisted under heaven's captaincy to do battle against the same enemy, the empire of darkness and wrong? Why, should we miss no one another, fight not against the enemy, but against ourselves, from mere difference of uniform? All uniforms shall be good. So they hold in the true valiant men. All fashions of arms, the Arab turban and the swift scimitar, Thor's strong hammer smiting down Eotans, they shall be welcome. Luther's battle voice, Dante's march melody. All genuine things are with us, not against us. We are all under one captain, soldiers of the same host. So let us now take a little look at this Luther's fighting what kind of battle it was, and how he comported himself in it. Luther, too, was of our spiritual heroes, a prophet to his country and time. As introductory to the whole, a remark about idolatry will perhaps be in place here. One of Muhammad's characteristics, which indeed belongs to all prophets, is unlimited implacable zeal against idolatry. It is the grand theme of prophets. Idolatry, worshipping of dead idols as divinity, is a thing they cannot weigh with, but have to denounce continually, and brand with inexpiable reprobation. It is the chief of all the sins they see done under the sun. This is worth noting. We will not enter here into theological questions about idolatry. Idol as a dolon, a thing seen, a symbol. It is not God, but a symbol of God. And perhaps one may question whether Annie, the most benighted mortal, ever took it for more than a symbol. I fancy he did not think that the poor image his own hands had made was God, but that God was emblemed by it, that God was in some way or other in it. And now in this sense one may ask, is not all worship whatsoever a worship by symbols, by Eidola? or things seen, whether seen, rendered visible as an image or picture to the bodily eye, or visible only to an inward eye, to the imagination, to the intellect. This makes a superficial, but no substantial, difference, significant of Godhead, an idol, 
the most rigorous Puritan has his confession of faith, and intellectual representation of divine things, and worships thereby. Thereby is worship made first possible for him. All creeds, liturgies, religious forms, conceptions that fitly invest religious feelings, are in the sense eidola, things seen. All worship whatsoever must proceed by symbols, by idols. We may say all idolatry is comparative, and the worst idolatry is only more idolatrous. Where then lies the evil of it? Some fatal evil must lie in it, or earnest prophetic men would not on all hands so reprobate it. Why is idolatry so hateful to prophets? It seems to me as if, in the worship of those poor wooden symbols, the thing that had chiefly provoked the prophet and filled his inmost soul with indignation and aversion was not exactly what suggested itself to his own thought and came out of him in words to others as the thing. The rudest heathen hath worshipped Canopus, or the Kaaba black stone. He, as we saw, was superior to the horse that worshipped nothing at all. Nay, there was a kind of lasting merit in the poor act of his, analogous to what is still meritorious in poets, recognition of a certain endless divine beauty and significance in stars and all natural objects whatsoever. Why should the prophet so mercilessly condemn him? The poorest mortal, worshipping him, is fetish, while his heart is full of it, may be an object of pity and contempt and avoidance, if you will, but cannot surely be an object of hatred. Let his heart be honestly full of it, the whole space of his dark, narrow mind illuminated thereby, in one word, let him entirely believe in his fetish. It will then be, I should say, if not well with him, yet as well as it can readily be made to be, and you will leave him alone, unmolested there. But here enters the fatal circumstance of idolatry, that in the era of prophets no man's mind is any longer honestly filled with his idol or symbol. Before the prophet can arise, who, seeing through it, knows it to be mere wood, many men have begun dimly to doubt that it was little more. Condemnable idolatry is insincere idolatry. Doubt is even eaten out of the heart of it. A human soul is seen clinging spasmodically to an Ark of the Covenant, which it half feels now to have become a phantasm. This is one of the balefulest sights. Souls are no longer filled with their fetish, but only pretend to be filled, and would fain make themselves feel that they are filled. You do not believe, said Coleridge, uh, you only believe that you believe. It is the final scene in all kinds of worship and symbolism, the pure symptom that death is now nigh. It is equivalent to what we call formalism, and worship of formulas, in these days of ours. No more immoral act can be done by a human creature, for it is the beginning of all immorality, or rather it is the impossibility henceforth of any morality whatsoever. The innermost moral soul is paralyzed thereby, cast into fatal, magnificent sleep. Men are no longer sincere men. I do not wonder that the earnest man denounces this, brands it, prosecutes it with indistinguishable aversion. He and it, all good and it, are at death feud. Blamable idolatry is cant, and even what one may call sincere cant. Sincere cant, that is, worth thinking of. Every sort of worship ends with this phasis. I find Luther to have been a breaker of idols, no less than any other prophet. The wooden gods of the Koresh, made of timber and beeswax, were not more hateful to Mohammed than Tetzel's pardons of sin, made of sheepskin and ink, were to Luther. It is the property of every hero, in every time, in every place and situation, that he come back to reality, that he stand up upon things and not shows of things, according as he loves and venerates articulately or with deep speechless thought the awful realities of things, so will the hollow shows of things, however regular, decorous, accredited choruses or conclaves be intolerable and detestable to him. Protestantism, too, is the work of a prophet, the prophet work of that sixteenth century. 
the first stroke of honest demolition to an ancient thing grown false and idolatrous, preparatory afar off to a new thing, which shall be true and authentically divine. At first view, it might seem as if Protestantism were entirely destructive to this that we call hero worship and represent as the basis of all possible good religious or social for mankind. One often hears it said that Protestantism introduced a new era, radically different from any the world had ever seen before, the era of private judgment, as they call it. By this revolt against the Pope, every man became his own Pope, and learnt, among other things, that he must never trust any Pope, or spiritual hero captain any more, whereby is not spiritual union, all hierarchy, and subordination among men henceforth an impossibility. So we hear it said. Now, I need not deny that Protestantism was a revolt against spiritual sovereignties, popes, and much else. Nay, I will grant that English Puritanism, revolt against earthly sovereignties, was the second act of it that the enormous French Revolution itself was the third act, whereby all sovereignties and earthly spiritual were, as might seem, abolished or made sure of abolition. Protestantism is the grand root from which our whole subsequent European history branches out. For spiritual will always body itself forth in the temporal history of men. The spiritual is the beginning of the temporal, and now... Sure enough, the cry is everywhere for liberty and equality, independence and so forth. Instead of kings, ballot boxes and electoral suffrages, it seems made out of that any hero sovereign or loyal obedience of men to a man in things temporal or things spiritual has passed away forever from the world. I should despair of the world altogether, if so. One of my deepest convictions is that it is not so. Without sovereigns, true sovereigns, temporal and spiritual, I see nothing possible but an anarchy, the hatefulest of things. But I find Protestantism, whatever anarchic democracy it have produced, to be the beginning of new genuine sovereignty and order. I find it to be a revolt against false sovereigns, the painful but indispensable first preparative for true sovereigns getting place among us. That is worth explaining a little. Let us remark, therefore, in the first place, that this of private judgment is at bottom not a new thing in the world, but only a new at the epoch of the world. There was nothing generally or generically new or particular in the Reformation. It was a return to truth and reality in opposition to falsehood and semblance, as all kinds of improvement and genuine teaching are and have been. Liberty of private judgment, if we will consider it, must at all times have existed in the world. Dante had not put out his eyes or tied shackles on himself. He was at home in the Catholicism of his, a free-seeing soul in it. If many a poor Hogstrat and Tetzel and Dr. Eck had now become slaves in it. Liberty of judgment? No iron chain or outward force of any kind could ever compel the soul of a man to believe or disbelieve. It is his own indefeasible light that judgment of his, he will reign, and believe there, by the grace of God alone. The sorriest, sophistical, Bellamine, preaching sightless faith and passive obedience, must first, by some kind of conviction, have abdicated his right to be convinced. His private judgment indicated that as the advisablest step he could take. The right of private judgment will subsist in full force, wherever men subsist. A true man believes with his whole judgment, with all the illumination and discernment that is in him, and has always so believed. A false man, only struggling to believe that he believes, will naturally manage it in some other way. Protestantism said to this latter, Woe! And the former, well done. At bottom, it was no new saying. It was a return to all old sayings that ever had been said. Be genuine, be sincere. That was once more the meaning of it. Muhammad believed this with his whole mind, Odin with his whole mind, he and all true followers of Odinism. They, by their private judgment, had judged so. And now I venture to assert that 
The exercise of private judgment faithfully gone about does by no means necessarily end in selfish independence, isolation, but rather ends necessarily in the opposite of that. It is not honest inquiry that makes anarchy, but is its error, insincerity, half-belief, and untruth that make it. A man protesting against error is on the way towards uniting himself with all men that believe in truth. There is no communion possible among men who believe only in hearsays. The heart of each is lying dead, has no power of sympathy even with things, or he would believe them and not hearsays. No sympathy even with things. How much less with his fellow men? He cannot unite with men. He is an anarchic man. Only in a world of sincere men is unity possible. And there in the long run, it is a good as certain. But observe one thing, a thing too often left out of view, or rather altogether lost sight of in this controversy. That is, not necessarily a man should himself have discovered the truth he is to believe in, and never so sincerely to believe in it. A great man, we said, always was sincere as the first condition of him. But a man need not be great in order to be sincere. That is not the necessity of nature and all time, but only of certain corrupt, unfortunate epochs of time. A man can believe and make his own, in the most genuine way, what he has received from another, and with boundless gratitude to that other. The merit of originality is not novelty. It is sincerity. The believing man is the original man. Whatsoever he believes, he believes it for himself, not for another. Every son of Adam can become a sincere man, an original man, in this sense. No mortal is doomed to be an insincere man. Whole ages, what we call ages of faith, are original. All men in them, or the most of men in them, sincere. These are the great and fruitful ages. Every worker in all spheres is a worker not on semblance, but on substance. Every work it issues in a result. The general sum of such work is great. For all of it, as genuine, tends towards one goal. All of it is additive. None of it is subtractive. There is true union, true kingship, loyalty, all true and blessed things, so far as the poor earth can produce blessedness for men. Hero worship? Me, that a man be self-subsistent, original, true, or what we call it, is surely the farthest in the world from indisposing him to reverence and belief in other men's truth. It only disposes necessities and invincibly compels him to disbelieve other men's dead formulas, hearsays, and untruths. A man embraces truth with his eyes open, and because his eyes are open, does he need to shut them before he can love his teacher of truth? He alone can love, with a right gratitude and genuine loyalty of soul, the hero teacher who has delivered him out of darkness into the light. Is not such a one a true hero and serpent queller, worthy of all reverence? The black monster, falsehood, our one enemy in this world, lies prostrate by his valour. It was he that conquered the world for us. See, accordingly, was not Luther himself reverenced as a true pope or spiritual father, being verily such? Napoleon, form and mid-boundless revolt of sanculottism, became a king. Hero worship never dies nor can die. Loyalty and sovereignty are everlasting in the world. And there is this in them, that they are grounded not on garnitures and semblances, but on realities and sincerities. Not by shutting your eyes. Your private judgment? No. But by opening them, and by having them something to see. Luther's message was disposition and abolition to all false popes and potentates. But life and strength, though afar off, to new genuine ones. All this of liberty and equality, electoral suffrages, independence and so forth, we will take, therefore, to be temporary phenomenon by no means a final one though likely to last for a long time, with sad enough embroilments for us all, we must welcome it, as the penalty of sins that are past, the pledge of inestimable benefits that are coming. In all ways it behooved men to quit the simulacra and return to facts. Cost what it might, 
that it did behoove to be done. With spurious popes and believers having no private judgment, quacks, pretending to command over dupes, what can you do? Misery and mischief only. You cannot make an association out of insincere men. You cannot build an edifice except by plummet and level, at right angles to one another. In all this wild revolutionary work, from Protestantism onwards and downwards, oh, I see the blessedest result preparing itself. Not abolition or abolition of hero worship, but rather what I would call a whole world of heroes. If hero means sincere man, why may not every one of us be a hero? A world all sincere, a believing world, the like has been, the like will again be. Cannot help but be. That were the right sort of worshippers for heroes. Never could the truly better be so reverenced as where all were true and good. But we must hasten to Luther and his life. Luther's birthplace was Eisleben in Saxony. He came into this world there on the 10th of November, 1483. It was an accident that he gave his honour to Eisleben. His parents, poor mine labourers in a village of that region named Mora, had gone to Eisleben, went to fair. In the tumult of this scene, the Frau Luther was taken with travail, found refuge in some poor house there, and the boy she bore was named Martin Luther. Strange enough to reflect upon it, this poor Frau Luther. She had gone with her husband to make a small merchandising, perhaps to sell the lock of yarn she had been spinning, to buy the small winter necessaries for her narrow hunt or household. In the whole world of that day there was a more entirely unimportant locking pair of people than this miner and his wife, and yet all, that all were emperors, popes, and potentates in comparison. There was born here once more a mighty man, whose light was to flame at, as at the beacon over long centuries and epochs of the world. The whole world and its history was waiting for this man. And it is strange, but it is great. It leads us back to another birth hour, in a still meaner environment, eighteen hundred years ago, of which it is fit to say nothing, that we think only in silence for what words are there. The age of miracles past? The age of miracles is forever here. I find it altogether suitable to Luther's function in this earth, and doubtless wisely ordered to that end by providence presiding over him and us and all things, that he was born poor, and brought up poor, one of the poorest of men. He had to beg, as the school children in those mid in those times did, singing for arms and bread from door to door. Hardship, rigorous necessity, was the poor boy's companion. No man nor thing would put on a false face to flutter Martha and Luther. Among other things, not among the shows of things, had he to grow. A boy of rude figure, yet his weak health, with his large greedy soul, full of all faculty and sensibility, he suffered greatly. But it was his task to get acquainted with their realities, and keep acquainted with them, at whatever cost— his task was to bring the whole world back to reality, for it had dwelt too long with semblance. A youth nursed up in wintry whirlwinds, in desolate darkness and difficulty, that he may step forth at last from his stormy Scandinavia, strong as a true man as a god, a Christian Odin, a right Thor once more, with his thunder hammer to smite asunder ugly enough Jotuns and giant monsters. Perhaps the turning incident of his life, we may fancy, was that death of his friend Alexis by lightning at the gate of Erfurt. Luther had struggled up through boyhood, better or worse, displaying, in spite of all hindrances, the largest intellect. Eager to learn. His father, judging doubtless that he might promote himself in the world, set him upon study of law. This was the path to rise. Luther, with little will in it either way, had consented. He was now nineteen years of age. Alexis, and he had been to see the old people at Mansfeld, were got 
back again near Erfurt within the thunderstorm came on. The bolt struck Alexis. He fell dead at Luther's feet. So what is this life of ours? Gone in a moment, burnt up like a scroll into the blank eternity. What are all the earthly performance, chancellorships, kingships? They lie shrunk together there. The earth has opened on them. In a moment they are not, and eternity is. Luther, struck to hear this to his heart, determined to devote himself to God and God's service alone. In spite of all dissuasions from his father and others, he became a monk in the Augustan Covent at Erfurt. This was probably the first light point in the history of Luther, his purer, will now first decisively uttering itself, but for the present it was still a one light point in an element of darkness. He says he was a pious monk. Ich bin ein frommer Monk gewesen. Faithfully, painfully struggling to work out the truth of this high act of his, but it was to little purpose. His misery had not lessened, or rather, as it were, increased into an infin infinitude. The drudgeries he had to do as novice in his convent, all sorts of slave work, were not his grievance, the deep earnest soul of the man fallen into all manner of black scruples, dubitations, he believed himself likely to die soon, and far worse than die. One hears with a new interest of poor Luther that at this time he lived in terror of unspeakable misery. Fancied that he was doomed to eternal reprobation? Was it not the humble, sincere nature of the man? What was he? That he should be raised to heaven. He that had known only misery and mean slavery. The news was too blessed to be credible. It could not become clear to him how, by vast, fasts, vigils, formalities, and mass work, a man's soul could be saved. He fell into the blackest wretchedness, had to wander, staggering as on the verge of bottomless despair. It must have been a most blessed discovery, that of an old Latin Bible, which he found in the Erfurt Library about this time. He had never seen the book before. It taught him another lesson than that of fasts and vigils. A brother monk, too, of pious experience was helpful. Luther learned how that a man was saved not by his singing masses, but by the infinite grace of God, a more credible hypothesis. He gradually got himself founded as on the rock. No wonder he should venerate the Bible which had brought this blessed help to him. He prized it as the world of the highest must be prized by such a man. He determined to hold by that, as through life and to death he firmly did. This, then, is his deliverance from darkness, his final triumph over darkness, what we call his conversion. For himself the most important of all epochs, that he should now grow daily in peace and clearness, that unfolding now the great talents and virtues implanted in him, he should rise to importance in his convent, in his country, and be found more and more useful in all the honest business of life, is a natural result. He was sent on a mission by his Augustan order, as a man of talent and fidelity fit to do their business well. The elector of Saxony, Friedrich, named the wise, a truly wise and just prince, had cast his eye on him as a valuable person, made him professor in his new university of Wittenberg, preacher too at Wittenberg, in both which capabilities and capacities, as in all duties he did, this Luther, in the peaceable sphere of common life, was gaining more and more esteem with all good men. It was in his twenty-seventh year uh, that he first saw Rome, being sent thither, as I said, on mission from his convent. Pope Julius II, and what was going on at Rome, must have filled the mind of Luther with amazement. He had come, as to the sacred city, throne of God's high priest on earth, and he found it, what we know, many thoughts of his must have been given the man, many which we have no record of, which perhaps he did not himself know how to utter, this Rome, this scene of false priests clothed not in the beauty of holiness, but in far other vesture, is false. But what is it to Luther? A mean man he, how shall he reform the world? That was far from his thoughts. A humble, solitary man. Why should he at all meddle with the world? It was the task of quite higher men than he. 
His business was to guide his own footsteps wisely through the world. Let him do his own obscure duty in it well. The rest, horrible and dismal as it looks, is in God's hands, not in his. It is curious to reflect what might have been the issue had Roman popery happened to pass this Luther by, to go on in this great wasteful orbit, and not come athwart his little path and force him to assault it. Conceivable enough that, in this case, he might have held his peace about the abuses of Rome, left providence and God on high to deal with them. A modest, quiet man, not prompt to he to attack the irreverently persons in authority. His clear task, as I say, was to do his own duty, to walk wisely in the world of confused wickedness, and save his own soul alive. But the Roman high priesthood did commit and come athwart him. Afar off at Wittenberg, he, Luther, could not get lived in honesty for it. He remonstrated, resisted, came to extremity, was struck at, struck again, and so to came wager of battle between them. This is worth attending to in Luther's history. Perhaps no man of so humble, peaceable, or disposition ever filled the world with contention. We cannot but see the world that he would have loved privacy, quiet diligence in the shade, but it was against his will he ever became a notoriety. Notoriety. What would that do for him? The goal of his march through this world was the infinite heaven, an indubitable goal for him. In a few years he should have either attained that or lost it forever. We will say nothing at all, I think, of that sorrowfulest of theories, of its being some mean shopkeeper grudge, of the Augustan monk against the Dominican, the thirst kindled of wrath of Luther, and produce the Protestant Reformation. We will say to the people who maintain it, if indeed any exist now, get first into the sphere of thought by which it is so much as possible to judge of Luther, or of any man like Luther, otherwise than distractedly. We may then begin arguing with you. The monk Tetzel sent out uh, carelessly, in the way of trade, by Leo X, who merely wanted to raise a little money and for the rest seems to have been a pagan rather than a Christian, so far as he was anything, arrived at Wittenberg and drove his scandalous trade there. Luther's flock bought uh, indulgences in the confessional of his church. People pleaded to him that they had already got their sins pardoned. Luther if he would not be found wanting at his own post, a false sluggard and coward at the very centre of this little space of ground that was his own and of no other man's, had to step forth against indulgences and declare aloud that they were a futility and sorrowful mockery, that no man's sins could be pardoned by them. It was the beginning of the whole Reformation. We know how it went. Forward from this first public challenge of Tetzel on the last day of October, 1517. Through remonstrance and argument, spreading ever wider, rising ever higher, till it became unquenchable, and enveloped all the world. Luther's heart's desire was to have this grief and other griefs amended. His thought was still far off, and far other than anything that of introducing separation in the church, or revolting against the Pope, father of Christendom. The elegant pagan pope cared little about his monk and his doctrines, wished, however, that to have done with the noise of him. In the space of some three years, having tried various softer methods, he thought good to end it by fire. He dooms the monk's writings to be burnt by the hangman, and his body to be sent bound to Rome, probably for a similar purpose. It was the way they had ended with Hus, with Jerome, the century before. A uh, short argument, fire. Poor Huss. He came to that constant council, with all imaginable promises and safe conducts. An earnest, not rebellious kind of man, they laid him instantly in a stone dungeon, three feet wide, six feet high, seven feet long. Burnt the true voice of him out of this world, choked it in smoke and fire, Oh, that was not well done. I, for one, pardon Luther for now, altogether revolting against the Pope. The elegant pagan, 
by this fire decree of his, had kindled into noble just wrath the bravest heart then living in this world. The bravest, if also one of the humblest, peaceablest, it was now kindled. These words of mine, words of truth and soberness, aiming faithfully as human inability would allow to promote God's truth on earth and save men's souls, you, God's vice gerent on earth, answer them by the hangman on fire. You will burn me in them. For answer to the God's message they strove to bring you, you are not God's vice regent. You are another's than this, I think. I take your bull as an imparchmented lie and burn it. You will do what you see good next. This is what I do. It was the 10th of December, 1520, three years after the beginning of the business, that Luther, with a great con conscience and concourse of people, talked to his indignant step of burning the Pope's fire decree at the Elster Gate of Wittenberg. Wittenberg looked on with shoutings, and the whole world was looking on. The Pope should not have provoked that shout. It was the shout of the awakening of nations. The quiet German heart, modest, patient of much, had at length got more than it could bear. Formulism, pagan popism, and other falsehoods and corrupt semblance had ruled long enough. And here once more was a man who found who durst tell all men that God's will stood not on semblances but on realities. That life was a truth and not a lie. At bottom, as was said above, we are to consider Luther as a prophet idol-breaker, a bringer back of men to reality. It is the function of great men and teachers. Muhammad said, these idols of yours are wood. You put wax and oil on them, and the flies stick to them. They are not God. I tell you, they are black wood. Luther said to the Pope, this thing of yours that you call a pardon of sins, it is a bit of rag paper with ink. It is nothing else, and so much like it is nothing else. God alone can pardon sins. Popeship, spiritual fatherhood of God's church, is that a vain semblance of cloth and parchment? It is an awful fact. God's church is not a semblance. Heaven and hell are not semblances. I stand on this since you drive me to it. Standing on this, I, a poor German monk, am stronger than you all. I stand solitary, friendless, but on God's truth. You with your tiaras, your triple hats, with your treasuries and armories, thunders, spiritual, temporal, stand on the devil's lie and are not so strong. The Diet of Worms. Luther's appearance there on the 17th of April, 1521, may be considered as the greatest scene in modern European history. The point, indeed, from which the whole subsequent history of civilization takes its rise. After multiplied negotiations and disputations, it had come to this. The young Emperor Charles V, with all the princes of Germany, papal nuncios, dignitaries, spiritual and temporal, are assembled there. Luther is to appear and answer for himself whether he will or can't or not. The world's pomp and power sits there on this hand. On that stands up for God's truth, one man. The poor minor hands Luther's son. Friends have had reminded him of Huss, advised him not to go. He would not be advised. A larger company of friends rode out to meet him. With still more earnest warnings, he answered, While there are as many devils and worms as there are roof tiles, I would on. The people on the morrow, as he went to the hell of the diet and the hall of the diet, crowded the windows and the housetops, some calling out to him in solemn words, not to recant. Whatsoever denieth me before men, they cried to him, as in a kind of solemn petition and adjuration. Was it not in reality our petition, too? The petition of the whole world, lying in dark bondage of soul, paralysed under the black spectral nightmare and triple-hatted chimera, calling itself Father and God, and what not? Free us. It rests with thee, desert us not. And Luther did not desert us. His speech of two hours distinguished itself by its respectful, wise, and honest tone, submissive to whatsoever could lawfully claim submission, not submissive to any more than that. 
His writings, he said, were partly his own, partly derived from the word of God. As to what was his own, human infirmity entered into it. Unguarded anger, blindness, many things, doubtless, which were, were a blessing for him, could be abolished altogether. But as to what stood on sound truth in the word of God, he could not recant. How could he? Confute me, he concluded, by proofs of scripture, or else by plain just arguments. I cannot recant otherwise, for it is neither safe nor prudent to do aught against conscience. Here stand I. I can do no other. God assist me. It is, as we say, the greatest moment in the modern history of men. English Puritanism, England and its parliaments, Americas, and the vast work of these two centuries, French Revolution, Europe and its work everywhere at present, the germ of it, all lay there. Had Luther in that moment done other, it had all been otherwise. The European world was asking him, Am I to sink ever lower into falsehood, stagnant, putrescence, loathsome, accursed death, or with whatever paroxysm, to cast the falsehoods out of me, and be cured and live? Great wars, uh, contentions, and disunion followed out of this reformation, which last down to our day, and are yet far from ended. Great talk and crimination has been made about these. They are lamentable undeniable. But after all, what has Luther, or his cause, to do with them? It seems strange, reasoning, to charge the Reformation with all this, when Hercules turned the purifying river into King Augustus' stables. I have no doubt the confusion that resulted was considerable all around, but I think it was not Hercules' blame. It was some other's blame. The Reformation might bring Results it liked when it came, but the Reformation simply could not help coming. To all popes and popes advocates, expostulating, lamenting, and accusing, the answer of the world is, once and for all, your popehood has become untrue. No matter how good it was, how good you say it is, you cannot believe it. The light of our whole mind, given us to walk by heaven above, finds it henceforth a thing unbelievable. We will not believe it. We will not try to believe it. We dare not. The thing is untrue. We were tailors against the giver of all truth. If we durst pretend to think it true, away with it. Let whatsoever likes come in place of it. With it we can have no further trade. Luther and his Protestantism is not responsible for wars. The false simulacra that forced him to protest, they are responsible. Luther did what every man that God has made has not only the right, but lies under the sacred duty to do. Answered a falsehood when it questioned him. Dost thou believe me? No. At what cost soever, without counting of costs, this thing behooved to be done, Union, organization, spiritual and material are far nobler than any popedom or feudalism in their truest days, I never doubt, is coming for the world. Sure to come. But on fact alone, not on semblance or simulacrum, will it be able to do either to come or to stand when it can. With union grounded on falsehood and ordering us to speak and act lies, we will not have anything to do. Peace? A brutal lethargy is peaceable. The noisome grave is peaceable. We hope for a living peace, not a dead one. And yet in prizing justly the indispensable blessings of the new, let us not be unjust to the old. The old was true, if it no longer is. In Dante's days it needed no sophistry, self-blinding, or other dishonesty, to get itself reckoned true. It was good then. Nay, there is in the soul of a deathless god. The cry of no popery is foolish enough in these days. The speculation that popery is on the increase, building new chapels and so forth, may pass for one of the idlest ever started. Very curious to count up the few popish chapels, listen to the few Protestant logic choppings. Too much dull droning, drowsy inanity, that still calls itself Protestant. And nay, see, Protestantism is dead. Popism is more alive than it. 
We'll be alive after it. Drowsy inanities. Not a few that call themselves Protestant are dead, but Protestantism has not died yet. That I hear of Protestantism, if we will luck, has in these days produced its Goethe, its Napoleon, German literature, and the French Revolution. Rather considerable signs of life. Nay, at the bottom, where else is alive but Protestantism? The life of most else that one meets is a galvanic one, merely. Not a pleasant, not a lasting sort of life. Popery can build new chapels, welcome to do so, at all lengths. Popery cannot come back, any more than paganism can, which also still lingers in some centuries, in some countries. But indeed, it is with these things, as with the ebbing of the sea, you look at the waves oscillating hither, thither, and on the beach, for minutes you cannot tell how it is going, not can half an hour where it is, not can half a century where your popehood is. Alas, would there were no greater danger to our Europe than the poor old Pope's revival. Thor may as soon try to revive. And with all this oscillation, there is a meaning. The poor Popehood will not die away entirely, as Thor has done, for some time yet. Nor ought it. We may say the old never dies till this happen, till all the soul of good that was in it have got itself transfused into a practical new. While a good work remains capable of being done by the Romish form, or what is inconclusive and inclusive of all, while a pious life remains capable of being led by it, just so long if we consider will this or the other human soul adopt it, go about as a living witness of it. So long as it is obtrude itself on the eye of us who reject it, till we in our practices too have appropriated whatsoever truth of it was in it, then, but also not until then, it will have no charm more for any man. It lasts here for a purpose. Let it last as long as it can. Of Luther I will now add, in reference to all those wars and bloodshed, the noticeable fact that none of them began so long as he continued living. The controversy did not get to fighting so long as he was there. To me it is proof of his greatness in all senses this fact. How seldom do we find a man that has stirred up some vast commotion? who does not himself perish, swept away in it. Such is the usual course of revolutionists. Luther continued, in a good degree, sovereign of this greatest revolution. All Protestants, of what rank or function soever, luck much to him for guidance, and he held it peaceable, continued firm in the centre of it. A man to do this must have a kingly faculty. He must have the gift to discern all the turns where the true heart of the matter lies and plant himself courageously on that as a strong true man, that other true men may rally round him here. He will not continue leader of men otherwise. Luther's clear deep force of judgment, his force of all sorts, of silence, of tolerance and moderation, among others, are very notable in these circumstances. Tolerance, I say, is a very genuine kind of tolerance that Luther possessed. He distinguishes what is essential and what is not. The unessential may go very much as it will. A complaint comes to him that such and such a reformed preacher will not preach without a cassock. Oh, well, answers Luther, what harm will a cassock do the man? Let him have a cassock to preach in. Let him have three, if he find the benefit in them. His conduct in the matter of the Karlstadt's wild image-breaking of the Anabaptists of the Peasants' War shows a noble strength, very different from the spasmodic violence. With sure prompt insight, he discriminates what is what. A strong, just man, he speaks forth what is the wise course, and all men follow him in that. Luther's written works give similar testimony of him. The dialect of these speculations is now grown obsolete for us, but one still reads them with a singular attraction and indeed the mere grammatical diction is still legible enough. Luther's merit in dialect of speculations and the literary history of is of the greatest. His uh, dialect uh, became the language of all writing. 
They are not well written, these four and twenty quartos of his, written hastily and quite other than literary objects, but in no books have I found a more robust, genuine, I will say noble, faculty of a man than these. A rugged honesty, homeliness, simplicity, a rugged sterling sense and strength. He dashes out of the illumination from him, and smiting idiomatic phrases seem to cleave into the very secret of the matter. Good humour, too, nay, tender affection, nobleness, and depth, this man could have been a poet, too. He had to work an epic poem, not write one. I call him a great thinker, as indeed his greatness of heart already had broken that. Richter says of Luther, his words are half battles. They may be called so. The essential quality of him was that he could fight and conquer, that he was a right piece of human valour. No more valiant man, no more heart to be called braver than the one record have ever lived in the Teutonic kindred whose character is valour. His defiance of the devils and worms was not a mere boast, as the like might be if now spoken, but it was a faith of Luther's that there were devils, spiritual denizens of the pit, continually besetting men. Many times in his writings this turns up, and a most uh, small sneer has been grounded on it by some. In the room of the Wartburg, where he sat translating the Bible, they still show you a black spot on the wall, the strange memorial of one of those conflicts. Luther sat translating one of the Psalms. He was worn down with long labour, with sickness, abstinence from food. There rose before him some hideous, indefinable image, which he took for the evil one, to forbid his work. Luther started up with a fiend defiance, flung his inkstand at the spectre, and it disappeared. The spot still remains there. Curious monument of several things. An apothecary's apprentice can now tell you of and thus that not to think of this apparition in a scientific sense. The man's heart that dare rise defiant face to face against hell itself can give no higher proof of fearlessness. This thing he will quell before exists not on this earth or under it, fearless enough. The devil is aware, writes he on one occasion, that this does not proceed out of fear in me. I have seen and defied Fied innumerable devils. Duke George, of Leipzig, a great enemy of his, Duke George is not equal to one devil, far short of a devil. If I had business at Leipzig, I would ride into Leipzig, though it rained Duke George's for nine days running. What a revers reservoir of dukes to ride into. But at the same time, they err greatly who imagine that this man's courage was ferocity, mere coarse, disobedient obstinacy and savagery, as many do. Far from that. There may be an absence of fear, which arises from the absence of thought or affection, from the presence of hatred and stupid fury. We do not value the courage of the tiger highly. With Luther, it was far otherwise. No accusation could be more unjust than this of mere ferocious violence brought against him. Most gentle heart withal, full of pity and love, as indeed the truly valiant heart ever is. The tiger, before a stranger foe, flies. The tiger is not what we call valiant, only fierce and cruel. I know few things more touching than those of soft, breathings of affection, soft as a child's or as a mother's in this great wild heart of Luther, so honest, unadulterated, with any cant. Homely, rude in their utterance, pure as water welling from the rock. What, in fact, was all the down-pressed mood of despair and reprobation which we saw in his youth, but the outcome of preeminent thoughtful gentleness, affections too keen and fine. It is the course of such men that the poor poet Cowper fall into. Luther, to a slight observer, might have seemed a timid, weak man, modesty, affectionate, shrinking, tenderness, the chief distinction of him. It is a notable and noble valour which is roused in a heart like this, once stirred up into defiance, all kindled into a heavenly blaze. 
In Luther's Table Talk, a posthumous book of anecdotes and sayings collected by his friends, the most interesting now of all the books proceeding from him, we have many beautiful unconscious displays of the man, and what sort of nature he had. His behaviour at the deathbed of his little daughter, so still, so great and loving, is among the most affecting things. He is resigned to that his little Magdalene should die, yet longs inexpressibly that she might live. Follows an awestruck thought, the flight of a little soul through one of those unknown realms. Awestruck, most heartfelt, we can see, and sincere. For all the dogmatic creeds and articles, he feels what nothing it is that we know or can know. His little Magdalena shall be with God, as God wills. For Luther, too, that is all. Islam is all. Once he looks out from his solitary Patmos, the castle of Coburg, in the middle of the night, the great vault of immensity, long flights of clouds sailing through it, dumb, gaunt, huge. Who supports all that? None ever saw the pillars of it, yet it is supported. God supports it. We must know that God is great, that God is good, and trust where we cannot see. Returning home from Leipzig, once he is struck by the beauty of the harvest fields, how it stands, that golden yellow corn on its fair tapered stem, its golden head bent, all rich and waving there, the meek earth at God's kind bidding has produced it once again, the bread of man. In the garden at Wittenberg, one evening at sunset, a little bird is perched for the night. That little bird says Luther above it, in the stars and deep heavens of worlds, but it has folded its little wings, gone trustfully there to rest in its home. The maker of it has given it too a home. Neither are mirthful turns wanting. There is a great free human heart in this man. The common speech of him as a rugged nobleness. Idiomatic, expressive, genuine, gleams here and there with his uh, beautiful poetic tints. One feels him to be a great a brother man. His love of music, indeed. Is not this, as it were, a summary of all the affections in him? Many a wild unutterability. He spoke forth from him in the tones of his flute. The devils fled from his flute, he says. Death defiance on the one hand, and such love of music on the other. I could not call these two opposite poles of a great soul. Between these two, all great things had room. Luther's face is to me expressive of him. In Cranach's uh, best portraits, I find the true Luther. A rude plebeian face, with his huge crag-like brows and bones, the emblem of rugged energy. At first, almost a repulsive face. Yet in the eyes, especially there is a wild, silent sorrow and unnameable melancholy, the element of all gentle and fine affections, giving to rest the true stamp of nobleness. Laughter was in this Luther, as we said, but tears also were there. Tears also were appointed him, tears and hard toil. The basis of his life was sadness, earnestness. In his later years, after all triumphs and victories, he expresses himself heartily wary of living. He considers that God alone can and will regulate the course things are taking, and that perhaps the day of judgment is not far. As for him, he longs for one thing, that God would release him from his labour and let him depart and be at rest. They understand little of the man who sight in this discredit of him, I will call this Luther a true great man, great in intellect, in courage, affection, and integrity. One of our most lovable and precious men. Great, not as a hewn obelisk, but as an alpine mountain, so simple, honest, spontaneous, not setting up to be great at all. There for quite another purpose than being great. Ah, yes. Unsubduable granite, piercing far and wide into the heavens, yet in the clefts of its fountains, green and beautiful valleys with flowers. A right spiritual hero and prophet, once more a true son of nature and fact, for whom these centuries and many that are to come yet will be thankful to heaven. The most interesting basis which the Reformation anywhere assumes, especially for us English, is that of Puritanism. In Luther's own country, Protestantism soon dwindled into a rather barren affair, not a religion or faith, but rather now a theological jangling of argument, uh, prophecy to, on the heart, 
the essence of its sceptical contention, which indeed has jangled more and more down the to Voltairism itself through Gustavus Adolphus, contentions onwards to French Revolution ones. But in our island there arose a Puritanism, which even got itself established as a Presbyterianism, a national church among the Scotch, which came forth as a real business of the heart, and has produced in the whole world a very notable fruit. In some senses one may say it is the only faces of Protestantism that has ever got the rank of being a faith, a true heart communication with heaven, and of exhibiting itself in history as such. We must spare a few words for Knox. Himself, a brave and remarkable man, but still more important as chief priest and founder, which one may consider him to be of the faith that became Scotland's. New England's Oliver Cromwell's. History will have something to say about this for some time to come. We may censure Puritanism as we please, and none, one of us, I suppose, but would find it a very rough, defective thing. But we and all men may understand that it was a genuine thing, for nature has adopted it, and it has grown and grows. I say sometimes that all goes by wager of battle in this world, the strength well understood is the measure of all worth. Give a thing time, if it can succeed, it is a right thing. Look now at American Saxondom, and that little fact of the sailing of the Mayflower two hundred years ago from Delft Haven in Holland. Where we of open sense, as the Greeks were, we had found a poem here, one of nature's own poems, such as she writes in broad facts over great continents. For it was properly the beginning of America. There were struggling settlers in America before some material as of a body was there, but the soul of it was first this. These poor men, driving out of their own country, not able well to live in Holland, determined on settling in the new world. Black, untamed forests are there, and wild, savage creatures, but not so cruel as Star Chamber hangmen. They thought that the earth would yield them food. If they tilled it honestly, the everlasting heaven would stretch there too overhead. They should be left in peace to prepare for eternity by living well in this world of time, worshipping in that they thought was true, not the idolatrous way. They clubbed their small meals together, hired a ship, the little Mayfair, and made ready to sail. In Neil's History of the Puritans, 1755, there is an account of the ceremony of their departure, solemnity, we might call it rather, for it was a real act of worship. Their minister went down with them to the beach, and their brethren, whom they were to leave behind, all joined in solemn prayer that God would have pity on his poor children, and go with them into that waste wilderness, for he had also made that he was there also as well as here. Ah, these men, I think, had a work. The weak thing, weaker than a child, becomes strong one day if it be a true thing. Puritanism was only despicable, laughable then, but nobody can manage to laugh at it now. Puritanism has got weapons and sinews. It has firearms, war navies. It has cunning in its ten fingers, strength in its right arm. It can steer ships, fell forests, remove mountains. It is the one of the strongest under the sun at present. In the history of Scotland, too, I find the properly but one epoch. We may say it contains nothing of world interest at all but this reformation by Knox. A poor barren country, full of continual broils, dissensions, massacrings, a people in the last state of rudeness and destitution, little better perhaps than Ireland at this day. Hungry, fierce barons, not so much as able to form any arrangement with each other, how to divide what they fleeced from these poor drudges, but obliged as the Colombian republics are this day to make every alternation a revolution. No way of changing a ministry but by hanging the old ministers on gibbets. This is a historic spectacle of no singular significance. Bravery enough, I doubt not. Fierce fighting in abundance, but not braver or fiercer than any of their Scandinavian sea-king ancestors, 
whose exploits we have not found worth dwelling on. It is a country as yet without a soul. Nothing developed in it but what is a rude external semi-animal. And now at the Reformation the internal life is kindled, as it were, under the ribs of this outward material death, a cause of the noble, noblest of causes, like a beacon set on high, high as heaven yet obtainable from earth, whereby the meanest man becomes not a citizen only, but a member of Christ's visible church, a veritable hero, if he prove a true man. Well, this is what I mean by the whole nation of heroes, a believing nation. There needs not a great soul to be make a hero. There needs a God-created soul, which will be true to its origin. That will be a great soul. The like has been seen, we find. The like will be seen again under the wider forms than the Presbyterian. There can be no lasting good one till then. Impossible, say some. Possible? Has it not been in the world as a practised fact? Did hero worship fail in Knox's case? Or are we made of other clay now? Did the Westminster Confession of Faith add some new property to the soul of man? God made the soul of man. He did not doom any soul of man to live as a hypothesis and hearsay in a world filled with such, but with the fatal work and fruit of such. But to return, this that Knox did for the nation, I say, we may really call a resurrection as from death. It was not a smooth business, but it was welcome, surely, and the cheap price had it been far off her. And the whole cheap at any price, as life is, the people began to live. They needed, first of all, to do that. And what cost and cost soever, Scotch literature and thought, Scotch industry, James Watt, David Hume, Walter Scott, Robert Burns. I find Knox and the Reformation acting in the heart's core of every one of these persons and phenomena. I find that without the Reformation, they would not have been. Or what of Scotland? The Puritanism of Scotland became that of England and of New England. A tumult in the High Church of Edinburgh spread into a universal battle and a struggle over all these realms. There came out, after fifty years struggling, what we call the Glorious Revolution, a Habeas Corpus Act, free parliaments, and much else. Alas, it is not too true what we said, that many men in the van do always, like Russian soldiers, march into the ditch of Schweidnitz and fill it up with their dead bodies, that the rear may pass over them dry-shod and gain the honour? How many earnest, rugged Cromwells, Knoxes, poor peasant covenanters, wrestling, battling for very life, in rough, miry places have to struggle and suffer and fall, greatly censured, admired, before a beautiful revolution of 88, can step forward over them in official pumps and silk stockings with universal three times three. It seems to me hard measure that this Scottish man, now after 300 years, should have to plead like a culprit before the world, intrinsically for having been in such a way as it had not been possible to be the bravest of all Scotchmen. Had he been a poor half and half, he could have crouched into the corner like so many others. Scotland had not been delivered, and Knox had not been without blame. He is the one Scotchman to whom, of all others, his country and the world owe a debt. He has to plead that Scotland could forgive him for having been worth to any in a million unblameable Scotchmen the need for no forgiveness. He bared his breast to the battle, had to row in French galleys, wander forlorn in exile, in clouds and storms was censured, shot at through his windows, had a right, sore, fighting life. If this world were his place of recompense, he had made it but a bad venture of it, I cannot apologise for Knox. To him it is very indifferent that these two hundred and fifty years or more what men say of him. But we, having got above those details of his battle, living now in clearness and the fruits of his victory, we, for our own sake, 
or to look through the rumours and controversies enveloping the man and then into the man himself. For one thing, I will remark that this uh, post of profit to his nation was not of his seeking. Knox had lived forty years quietly, obscure, before he became conspicuous. He was the son of poor parents, had got a college education, become a priest, adopted the Reformation, and seemed well content to guide by his own steps into the light of it, no wise and duly intruding it on others. He had lived as tutor in gentlemen's families, preaching when any body of persons wished to hear his doctrine, resolute he to walk by the truth and speak the truth when called to it. Not ambitious of more, not fancying himself capable of more. In this entirely obscure way he had reached the age of forty. Was a small body of reformers were he standing siege in St. Andrew's Castle, when one day, in their chapel, the preacher, after finishing the exhortation to these fighters in the forlorn hope, and suddenly, that there ought to be other speakers, that all men who had a priest's heart and gift in them ought now to speak, which gift? and heart of their own number, John Knox, the name of him had. Had he not, said the preacher, appealing to all the audience, what then his duty? The people answered affirmatively. It was a criminal forsaking of his post if such a man held that the word was in him silent. So poor Knox was obliged to stand up. He attempted to reply. He could not say no word, burst into a flood of tears and ran out. It is worth remembering that scene. He was in grievous trouble for some days. He felt what a small faculty was his for this great work. He felt what a baptism he was called to be baptised withal. He burst into tears. A primary characteristic of a hero, that he is sincere, applies emphatically and emphatically to Knox. He, it is not denied anywhere that this, whatever might be his other qualities or false, is among the truest of men. With a singular instinct, he holds to the truth and fact. The truth alone is there for him. The rest a mere shadow of deceptive non-entity. However feeble, forlorn, the reality may seem on that, and that only can be. He take his hand into the galleys of the River Loire, where with the Knox and the others, after their castle of St. Andrews was taken, had been sent as galley slaves. Some officer or priest one day presented them an image of the Virgin Mother, requiring that they, the blasphemous heretics, should do it reverence. Mother, Mother of God, said Knox, when the turn came to him. This is no Mother of God. This is a pented bread, a piece of wood. I tell you with the paint on it. She is fitter for swimming, I think, than for being worshipped, added Knox, and he flung it into the river. It was not very cheap, jesting there, but come of it what might, this thing to Knox was and must continue nothing other than the real truth. It was pented bread. Worship it, he could not. He told his fellow prisoners in this darkest time to be of courage. The cause they had was the true one, and must and would prosper. The world would, could not put it down. Reality is of God's making. It is alone strong. How many pented breads, pretending to be real, are fitter to swim than to be worshipped? This Knox cannot live but by fact. He clings to reality as the shipwrecked sailor to the cliff. He is an instance to us, how a man, by sincerity itself, becomes heroic. It is the grant and grand gift he has. We find in Knox a good, honest intellectual talent, no transcendent one, a narrow, inconsiderable man, as compared with Luther, but in heartfelt, instinctive adherence to truth, in sincerity, as we say, he has no superior. Nay, one might ask, what equal he has? The heart of him is of the true prophet cast. He lies there, said the Earl of Morton at his grave, who never feared the face of man. He resembles more than any of the moderns an old Hebrew prophet. Same inflexibility, intolerance, rigid, narrow, looking adherence to God's stern rebuke in the name of God, to all that forsake truth. An old Hebrew prophet, 
in the guise of an Edinburgh minister of the 16th century. We are to take him for that, not require him to be other. Knox's conduct to Queen Mary, the harsh visits he used to make in her own palace to reprove her there, have been much commented upon. Such cruelty, such coarseness, fills us with indignation. On reading the actual narrative of the business, what Knox said and what Knox meant, I must say one's tragic feeling is rather disappointed. They are not so coarse, these speeches. They seem to me about as fine as the circumstance would permit. Knox was not there to do the courtier. He came on another errand. Whoever reading these colloquies with his wife, white of the queen, thinks that they are vulgar insolences of a plebeian priest to a delicate high lady, mistakes the purport and essence of them altogether. It was not, unfortunately, not possible to be polite with the queen of Scotland, unless one proved untrue to the nation and cause of Scotland. A man who did not wish to see the land of his birth made a hunting field for intriguing ambitions and ambitious guises and the cause of God trampled underfoot of falsehoods, formulas, and the devil's cause had no method of making himself agreeable. Better that women weep, said Morton, than that bearded man be forced to weep. Knox was the constitutional opposition party in Scotland. The nobles of the country, called by their station to take the post, were not found in it. Knox had to go, or no one. The hapless queen, but still more hapless country, if she were made happy. Mary herself was not without sharpness enough, among other qualities. Who are you, she said once, that presume to school the nobles and sovereign of this realm? Madam, a subject born within the same, he answered. Reasonably answered, if the subject have truth to speak, it is not the subject's footing that will fail him here. We blame Knox for his intolerance. Will surely it is good that each of us to be as tolerant as possible. Yet, at bottom, after all the talk there is and has been about it, what is tolerance? Tolerance has to tolerate the unessential and see well what that is. Tolerance has to be noble, measured, just, in its very wrath, when it can tolerate no longer. But on the whole, we are not altogether here to tolerate. We are here to resist, to control, and to vanquish with all. We do not tolerate falsehoods, thieveries, iniquities, when they fasten on us. We say to them, Thou art false, thou art not tolerable. We are here to extinguish falsehoods and put an end to them in some wise way. I will not quarrel so much with the way. The doing of the thing is our great concern. In this sense, Knox was full, surely, intolerant. A man sent to row in French galleys and such like for teaching the truth in his own land cannot always be in the mildest humour. I am not prepared to say that Knox had a soft temper, nor do I know that he had what we call an ill temper, an ill nature he decidedly he had not. Kind, honest affections dwelt in the much enduring, hard worn, ever battling man, that he could rebuke queens, and had such weight among the proud turbulent nobles, proud enough whatever else they were, and could maintain to the end a kind of virtual presidency and sovereignty in that wider realm. He who was only a subject born within the same. This of itself will prove to us that he was found close at hand to be no mean acrid man, but a hard, a healthful, strong, sagacious man. Such alone can bear the rule in that kind. They blame him for pulling down cathedrals, so forth. As if he were a seditious, rioting demagogue. Precisely the reverse is seen in the fact. In regard to the cathedrals, the rest of it, if we examine, Knox wanted no pulling down of the stone edifices. He wanted leprosy and darkness to be thrown out of the lives of men. Tumult was not 
his element. It was the tragic feature of his life. He was forced to dwell so much on that. Every such man is the born enemy of disorder. Hates to be in it. But what then? Smooth falsehood is not order. It is the general sum total of disorder. Order is truth. Each thing standing on the basis that it belongs to. Order and falsehood cannot subsist together. Withal, unexpectedly enough, this Knox has a vein of drollery in him, which I like much, in combination with his other qualities. He has a true eye for the ridiculous. His history, which, with its rough earnestness, is curiously enlivened with this. When the two prelates entering Glasgow Cathedral quarrel about precedence, march rapidly up to take hustling one another, twitching one another's earnestness, and rochets, and at last flourishing their croziers and quarter slaves, quarter slaves, it's a great sight for him in every way. Not mockery, scorn, bitterness alone, though there is enough of that too. But a true, loving, illuminating laugh mounts up over the earnest visage. Not a loud laugh, you would say. A laugh in the eyes, most of all. An earnest-hearted, brotherly man, brother to the high, brother also to the low. Sincere in his sympathy with both. He had his pipe of Bordeaux, too, we find, in that old Edinburgh house of his, a cheery social man, with faces that loved him. They go far wrong. We think this Knox was a gloomy, spasmodic, shrieking fanatic. Not at all. He is one of the uh, solidest of men. Practical, cautious, hopeful, patient. Most shrewd, observing, quietly discerning man. In fact, he is very much the type of character we assign to the Scottish at present. A certain sardonic taciturnity is in him, in sight enough, and a stouter heart than he himself knows of. He has the power of holding his peace over many things which do not vitally concern him. They, what are they? But the thing which does vitally concern him, the thing that he will speak of, and in a tone the whole world shall be made to hear, all the more emphatic for his long silence. This prophet of the Scotch is to me no hateful man. He had a sore fight of an existence, wrestling with popes and principalities, in defeat, contention, lifelong struggle, rowing as a galley slave, wandering as an exile. A sore fight, but he won it. Have you hope? They asked him in the last moment, when he could no longer speak. He lifted his finger, pointed it upwards with his finger, and so died. Honour to him. His works have not died. The letter of his works... Dies as of all men's, but the spirit never. One word more as to the letter of Knox's work. The unforgivable offence in him is that he wished to set up priests over the head of kings. In other words, he strove to make the government of Scotland a theocracy. Uh, this, indeed, is probably the sum of his offences, the essential sin, for which what pardon can there be? It is most true he did at bottom, consciously or unconsciously, mean a theocracy, a government of God. He did mean that kings and prime ministers and all manner of persons in public or private, diplomatizing or whatever else they might be doing, should walk according to the gospel of Christ and understand that this was their law, supreme over all laws. He hoped once to see that such a thing was realized, and the petition, Thy kingdom come, is no longer an empty word. He was sore grieved when... He saw greedy, worldly barons clutch hold of the church's property. When he expostulated that it was not secular property, but that it was spiritual property, and should be turned into the true churchly uses, education, school, worship, and the region Murray had to answer with a shrug of the shoulders, it is a devout imagination. This was Knox's scheme of right and truth. This he zealously endeavoured after, and to realise it, if we think of a scheme of truth was too narrow, was not true, we may rejoice that he could not realise it, that it remained after two centuries of effort unrealisable and is a devout imagination still. But how shall we blame him for struggling to realise it? Theocracy, government of God, is precisely the thing to be struggled for. All prophets, zealous priests, are there for that purpose. Hildebrand, wise to theocracy, 
Cromwell wished it, fought for it, Mahomet attained it. Nay, is it not what all zealous men, whether called priests, prophets, or whatsoever else called, do essentially wish and must wish? That right and truth, O God's law, reign supreme among men. This is the heavenly ideal. Well, named in Knox's time, and nameable in all times, a revealed will of God. Towards which the reformer will insist that all be more and more approximated. All true reformers, as I said, are by the nature of them priests, and strive for a theocracy. How far such ideals can ever be introduced into practice, and what point our impatience with their non-introduction ought to begin, is always a question. I think we may safely say, let them introduce themselves as far as they can contrive to do it. If they are the true faith of men, all men ought to be more or less impatient always where they are not found introduced. They will never be wanting Regent Murray's enough to shrug their shoulders and say, meh, a devout imagination. We will praise the hero priest, rather, who does what is in him to bring them in and wears it out in toil, calumny, contradiction, a noble life, to make a god's kingdom of this earth. Earth will not become too godlike. Not become 